The title of my presentation is Indigeneity and Endemicity in an Environmental Archaeology Narrative. Uh, this presentation forms a part of my ongoing PhD research. And I start off with the uh, research context and place of study, which is the Philippine archipelago. Uh, inset up here, just to locate, is um, Southeast Asia, and that's where the Philippines is. And the, in particular, it's two uh, islands that I'm looking at. It's called Palawan and Luzon. And in Luzon, it's nor this northeast area called Galayan. But for today, I'm going to focus on Palawan Island. Um, now, the two, these two islands hold the longest archaeological sequences in the Philippine archipelago, and that's why I chose them. And uh, also some of the oldest evidence of human occupation uh, and human colonization in uh, Southeast Asia. The PhD itself is a zooarchaeological project exploring endemic faunas and foraging practices in tropical island environments. Um, now, the work adopts a two-pronged ecological approach, which aims to produce two interconnected sets of ecological knowledge. The first element of this approach is um, paleoecological and paleozoological in nature, wherein I aim to address questions regarding past faunal communities and environmental changes. This aspect of the PhD is uh, driven by a requisite to understand biodiversity dynamics in a highly diverse uh, biogeographic area. Within uh, biological circles, the Philippines is considered um, as a model island archipelago for investigating processes of diversification and other evolutionary processes. The archipelago is composed of five major faunal regions, and all of these display substantial levels of diversity and endemism, hence its designation as a global biodiversity hotspot. The focus of the research um, is on the late quaternary mammalian fossil record of uh, Luzon and Palawan. So grounded on the existing environmental data of the Philippines and of the region, the second element of the uh, ecological approach is an, an investigation of human ecological knowledge systems in the past. This concept is known and used in anthropological and ethnobiological literature by several names, uh, such as traditional ecological knowledge, tech, indigenous ecological knowledge, IEK, or more broadly, indigenous knowledge, or IK. The investigation of IEK in this research particularly relates to human adaptations in tropical island environments across time. The behavioral, behavioral adaptations are grounded in place and time in a similar way that indigenous ecological knowledge is formulated. That is, it is rooted to a particular place and generated from practical engagements of people living in specific locales. This forms one of several conceptual links by which we can utilize zooarchaeological and taphonomic data in order to frame past IEK systems. Indeed, at a certain level, we can view zooarchaeological and archaeological knowledge from particular sites as um, forming in indigenous knowledge systems. Um, I was drawn to this particular session because of its deli um, deliberate attention to the practice of archaeology and to the nature, negotiation, and politics of archaeological knowledge. Prior to doing this PhD project and during the course of it, Time and again, my colleagues and I experienced these lived realities and encounters with local community members and indigenous groups that invari invariably lead me to question the relevance and context of archaeological production of knowledge within our regional setting. Um, so going on to sort of a broader context, um, anthropology and archaeology as it is practiced today in the Philippines was injected into Filipino consciousness through the American educational system. During the turn of the 20th century and the onset of the American colonial regime, the policy of benevolent assimilation was promulgated with the goal of a so-called civilizing effect. To this end, the American public educational system and the English language were introduced and instituted along with other American-style political and social institutions. In its late 19th century and early 20th roots in the Philippines, archaeological practice has been labeled as accidental by Victor Paz, wherein the value of archaeology was recognized 
but there was little directed or conscious effort to study antiquities. From what available collections were gathered, primarily by Henry Otley Weyer, the framework that he adopted to interpret such data followed the linear evolutionism and diffusionism prevalent at the time. So a dominant narrative, narrative for a long time was it's called the three-wave uh, migration. So there were waves of migrations of, of populations, first by Negritos and then Malays and so on, which presumably possessed increasingly more complex technologies and cultures compared to their antecedents. Now from these early days of archaeology in the Philippines, the discipline has of course transformed and nowadays it is being used as a methodological and discursive tool in anti-colonial, post-colonial, and decolonial narratives that dispute colonial historiographies. In Spanish and American colonial historiography, there are many iterations of the colonial self and its many others. In both paradigms, there was hardly a notion of a deep history or a deep past before colonization. These were deliberately erased or ignored. The indigenous writing systems, for instance, called by Bayin, largely disappeared during the course of Spanish colonial rule, hence this apparent dearth of written or historical sources. In many ways, there is a present-day impression that history begins or pick, picks up at colonization, which to this day modern history curricula per perpetuate. Other iterations uh, of this self-other uh, dichotomy is found in, in, um, in these dichotomies listed here, such as civilized versus uncivilized, converted and non-Christian, lowland versus upland dwellers, um, Tagabayan, those that uh, live in the towns, which were, and they were perceived more as, they were perceived as more genuine Filipinos, as opposed to those who live in the mountains and the peripheries. Um, mm. Yeah, but, um, one thing we can say is that through archaeology now, we are able to, or, we, or at least we're trying to unearth the histories of these so-called peripheries, this, these forests and uplands and caves and other terrains. So when perceived through a deep and diachronic past, 400 years of colonization appears to be a blip in our reckoning of this, of this past. And so it is within this context, among mm -hmm. others, that Philippine archaeology provides a window into deep and plural pasts of its indigenous inhabitants. <coughs> Archaeology retains uh, its foreignness as a specialized, specialized field of knowledge in this context. And the translation, ar archaeologia or archaeology, is not really um, very well entrenched in Filipino consciousness. When it is infused into wider public discourse, archaeology is intertwined with the national, nationalist discourse of Filipino identity. As in many other Southeast Asian nation states, archaeological resources and heritage form an integral, integral part of nationalist discourse. These resources are enshrined in Philippine laws as owned and protected by the state in an extension of the regalian doctrine. However, there are tensions between government bureaus and units about the protection and custody of such resources. Archaeological discourse in the Philippines is also predominantly in the English language. Only in rarer occasions are they in Filipino. Such cases are said to not be unique to academic cultures in nation states that underwent an experience of identity schizophrenia due to colonialism. Even then, Filipino is also just one of about 180 languages spoken across the archipelago, and the constitution of a Filipino identity is itself a contest, contested matter. What is clearly in our collective consciousness is instead kasaysayan, what we call kasaysayan, which is the translation, which is uh, how history translates into Filipino. The root word here is saysay, and that can translate to both narrative and meaning. One important and influential historiogra historiographical paradigm is called the Pantayong Pananaw. This is roughly translated as a for us, of us, and by us perspective. And it is primarily in Filipino. In this perspective, Kasaysayan 
is defined as salaysay na may saysay, which translates as narrative with meaning or meaningful narrative. In this definition, there is no distinction between history and prehistory. Hence, one important conceptual baggage is effectively discarded. The normative primacy of historical records contrast, contrasted with the absence or erasure of indigenous records, written records, and the secondary importance of non-written uh, resources. Now, even though archaeology as a discipline is foreign and colonial in its roots, there are local transformations by which it is utilized as a tool for decolonization. For one, through archaeology, there are methods by which a pre-colonial past can be retrieved or remembered, interpreted or generated. Archaeological methodologies can enable us to make sense and give sense to the past, or bigyang sai sai, um, again, um, trying to unpack um, uh, the concept of kasaysayan. Among the local community of archaeologists, there is sort of a, a growing critical mass of local archaeologists, there, and there is increasing self-reflection with more heritage-conscious efforts by a new generation of practitioners that aims to engage a wider public and local communities in the interpretation of archaeological knowledge and translation of narratives of the past. So it is within this very broad conceptual and experiential terrain that I navigate the PhD research and contemplate its relevance to a, di to a diverse local public. On the one hand, there are these thematic and regional archaeological um, discourses that I try to engage with, like biodiversity dynamics and then human adaptation and colonization of tropical environments in Southeast Asia. And then on the other hand, there is this attempt at using other heuris heuristic tools, such as using the concept of uh, indigenous knowledge and ecological knowledge from anthropology and ethnobiology. Many authors have remarked on what constitutes indigeneity or indigenousness in IK and IEK. In my first language, Filipino, indigenous translates uh, to katutubo, and the, and the root word is tubo, which connotes uh, to be rooted uh, in and to grow. Of the many characteristics of indigenous knowledge, what I highlight here is the idea that it is local. That is, it is rooted to a particular place and set of experiences and generated by people living in those places. I also underscore the notion of rootedness that knowledge is situated and located in particular milieus and embedded in a field of human environment relations. So the notion of indigenous here pertains to knowledge regarding local practices contextualized, contextualized in place and time. This also includes knowledge of specific environments in the past, including the endemic animal faunas. And, and so in this case, endemism lends itself to the particularities and specific specificity of ecological knowledge because of the native plants uh, and animals found nowhere else and the unique ecological communities in these islands. Now, to begin such a narrative, I present some of the groundwork of the PhD research, particularly on Palawan Island. Uh, I focus on uh, one particular site on this island called Pilandok Cave. Uh, it is a late Pleistocene site in the southern part of in the southern part of uh, the island. Establishing, uh, sorry, and so in this sequence, this um, twenty-five thousand. So it's roughly uh, from the last glacial maximum at around twenty-five thousand years old, um, and um, I'm going to connect that to uh, existing uh, or known uh, zoarchaeological sequences from these two other sites, which are. Okay, over there. Um, establishing a, a chronology for Pilandok was one of the initial aims. It was first excavated in 1969 to 70 by American anthropologist Jonathan Kress in the National Museum of the Philippines. He reported three uh, radiocarbon dates ranging in age from 18,000 to 25,000 BP. 
These are shell dates from the 1970s, however, from unknown taxa, and so the dates have been received with skepticism. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, I got dates from Oxford, um, these two dates, and hopefully some more are forthcoming. And calibrated, when calibrated, they are um, about 24,500 uh, years. So, uh, we're, uh, so the time uh, frame I'm working in is the last glacial maximum for Pilando Cave. And at this point in time, during the LGM, uh, Palawan is, has a, uh, quite a different environment from the present day. And <coughs> it formed a greater landmass connected to, um, connected to islands in the south over there and islands in, in the north over there and here. So it formed a much greater landmass. Um, and in fact, present day Palawan is just about 11% of this uh, um, LGM configuration. Um, so like many places in the Pleistocene, Palawan was a different uh, island at that time. And its human inhabitants would have encountered a different landscape and large animals that are not, that are not currently extinct, but once roamed this terrain. I focus on two extinct taxa in this presentation. The first of them is the largest known felid in the region, uh, which is the tiger, Panthera tigris. As we know, this is a charismatic and magnificent uh, species. It's the largest obligate terrestrial carnivore uh, in the faunal assemblages where it occurs, and it's a powerful flagship taxon for conservation. We first reported the presence of tiger on Palawan from uh, three foot bones from uh, Ile Cave. And the age of that is terminal, is about 14,000 to uh, the early Holocene. Um, now in Pilando, um, I'm trying to describe nine new specimens uh, of a much older age, and in a period when Palawan was near its maximum land mass configuration. Uh, there are two complete specimens, so these two, uh, um, third metacarpal and a uh, foot bone subterminal phalanx. Um, so this would be the oldest known occurrence of the tiger. And then um, its latest known occurrence would be in the early Holocene of uh, Ile Cave. Um, so this is the historic and uh, present day distribution. Present day is orange and uh, the historic distribution of the tiger in yellow. I just added uh, some uh, circles there where we have uh, fossil records of the tiger. Um, I can't add a dot to the Philippines because the map covers the Philippines, <laughs> but it's there. <laughs> but it's important to point out that um, these um, other fossil records are there because, for instance, one we think that um, the, the possible source population of the tiger in the Philippines is possibly from, from Borneo. Okay. Um, um, in Bahasa, so in sorry, well, in, in the places where it occurs in Malaysia and Indonesia, um, so in Bahasa Malay in Indonesia, uh, there is a term for the tiger, um, harimau. Um, um, yeah, it's a term for for the tiger and other large felids. Um, so for um, I think for Bahasa, it's harimau belang, which is um, a striped uh, harimau. Um, and then there's other translations for like the clouded leopard, but they're also harimau. In Dayak, for instance, it's also harimau. Um, now, there is no local term for uh, the tiger in the Philippine languages. There is a cognate, though, for harimau, which is halimau. Um, and the halimau is a, is a genetic term that we use for large mythical beasts or monsters. Mm -hmm. Now, whether this is a rendering of the tiger in past mm -hmm. folklore or whether it's a borrowing from Bahasa, it, it's not really known. But it's interesting that there is that cognate there. Um, another extinct taxon is uh, the deer. Um, we have proposed two species, uh, one of them the Kalamian hog deer and another one that I have to describe, um, that we ascribe to the um, genus Rusa, and I'm working on the anchor morphology and the postcranial uh, metrics to further describe this taxa. The extinction of deer on Palawan has been a conundrum 
because the rest of the Philippine Islands retain their endemic species of, um, of deer. Uh, and yet in Palawan, there are no known historical records of both deer and tiger. Inter interestingly, the, the site Pilandok is the vernacular name for the mouse deer, Tragulus nigricans. It's a very tiny, it's a different uh, kind of animal altogether, tiny like that. Um, and so the name for the caves appears to be in recognition of the remains of the deer, of the fossil deer on the site. Um, the Pilandok is assemblage is dominated by this large, larger deer taxon, the Rusa one, accounting for 80% of the bone assemblage. Pilandok appears to be a specialized campsite for deer processing. This is in contrast to the late Holocene sequences of Ile Cave and Pasimbahan Cave, which in the late, the middle and late Holocene are do dominated by wild pig. We have argued elsewhere about this turnover regarding the shift from deer and pig hunting on Palawan Island. Uh, the Pilandok record further substantiates this uh, correlation, where in, in the Pleistocene and the early Holocene, the hunted assemblages are dominated by deer. And then, um, as I said, by, by the mid-Holocene, it changes in, uh, to pig primarily. Moreover, um, there's also possibly a diversification in the hunting spectrum in, in the Holocene. Where in a lot of um, medium and small sized vertebrates are found in the, the Holocene sequences, but you don't see them in the terminal Pleistocene. And in the case of Pilandok, uh, in the LGM, they're, they're not there as well. Yeah, so, so actually, that is um, this, it's sort of the beginning of the narrative that I am trying to build. Um, right now, it's uh, to this point, the, the narrative is still very much cloaked in paleozoological uh, language. But what I am, do I have another slide? Yeah, I do have another slide. <laughs> but what I'm trying to do is um, um, to be able to connect these uh, long histories um, with the, the histories of foragers, indigenous groups that inhabit these islands at the present. Part of this involves reimagining these landscapes and these past environments with extinct animals. Um, and in the case of the isle, other island in Luzon Island, um, I'm making a case for, um, not for extinct forms, but in the, uh, on, on the other case, introduced animals, translocated animals. So trying to reimagine what were these places like with, with these animals, extinct animals on the one hand, and on the other hand, what were these animals, uh, these places like without these introduced animals yet. Um, so yeah, that's sort of the beginning.